Welcome to our final Macula and Me uh, session webinar for the year. It's been a full programme as usual, starting off with me in, in January, talking about benefits. And, um, and we've moved all the way through and covered so many different uh, topics um, from research, clinical, clinical stuff. We've done some um, technology as well, uh, so we've covered all bases, uh, which is which is really good. So thank you for coming and joining us this evening. Um, we've got a great webinar um, this evening, uh, which is someone, a couple of people are going to clinicians, researchers are going to come and fill us in uh, with some research they're about to undertake into something that's very close to my heart. Um, so it, it's, I'm very excited myself. So I'm very interested to hear what's happening this evening as well. Um, as usual, we're on a full webinar package, uh, which means that um, you don't have any concerns about sharing screens or anything like that or pressing accidentally pressing buttons because you can't. But what we really want you to do um, is interact with the speakers um, and, and ask them questions. And the way we'd like you to do that, uh, as, as I think a couple of you have found already, uh, the chat is up and running. Um, and so any questions that you have, if you pop them in the chat um, and we'll we'll store them up and then we'll, we'll ask the, um, the the speakers at the um, at the end of the meeting um, to um, to and we'll ask we'll ask the questions of them, basically. Um, so um, the, as always, uh, there's a couple of people here that uh, support me to do this. So firstly, um, there's Geraldine Hode, who is our research manager. She's got a new job title. I can't remember what it is. Uh, so it's our research manager. So good evening, Geraldine. How are you? Thank you. It's head of research grants. So okay. in charge of all of our research program and all the projects that we fund. Perfect. Brilliant. You see, I knew you'd remember it. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't expect to remember my own job title. It's really long. Uh, and, all, as, and always, uh, you'll, you'll help with the, the questions at the end. Yeah. Perfect. Brilliant. And the other person looking after all the controls and bits and pieces in the background is my support worker PA patient. So she's around. So um, she'll, she'll, if anything goes wrong, uh, she'll try and fix it with a bit of luck. Um, so uh, please just uh, be as interactive as possible. Um, as I say, this this will be available uh, after in, in, um, in a on the website and on YouTube uh, next week. So if you miss anything, you can always watch it again, which is fabulous. Um, so uh, without further waffling from me, uh, which, which is always a bit of benefit, uh, let me introduce our speakers. So we'll start off with uh, 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 Professor Omar Maru, um, who is um, from uh, Warfield. Am I, am I right? Am I guessing? Good evening, Omar. How are you? Evening. Good, thanks. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. I said, I've got so much stuff in my head. Sometimes I forget stuff. Thank you for coming this evening. And you're joined by your colleague, uh, Dr. Matteo Rizzi. So good evening, Matteo. How are you? Hi, good evening. Hi. Perfect. Brilliant. OK, well, without I'm going to pop myself on mute uh, and leave you guys to uh, leave you guys on. So I think you're starting on your own one. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, okay. Over to you guys. Thanks. So I'll just share my screen. So I have some slides, but um, and I know they won't be um clear to everyone um and that's totally fine they just sort of help me a bit as a placeholder and i'll try and describe the things on them um and happy to be interrupted at any time um so thanks very much for the invitation um i'm a consultant ophthalmologist at moorfields and i see patients with inherited retinal disease and many patients with star guards um and um i thought i'll give a little bit of an introduction um, I'm sure many people um, know a lot of what I'm going to say, uh, maybe even better than me. Um, uh, and then we'll move on to Matteo, who's going to talk about the specific project. So um, inherited retinal disease, generally genetic diseases of the retina, um, people imagine that they're all very rare and, and, and each one individually probably is quite rare. But overall, they, they're the largest cause of working age blindness registration in England and Wales. So they are um, a big cause of, of visual impairment. Um, most unfortunately aren't treatable which is which is uh difficult for patients and and uh, doctors um and uh, but there is there are advances um happening and there is gene therapy for one particular uh, there is a treatment for one particular genetic cause not star guards, but um, uh, inherited retinal disease related to a gene called RP65. There are over 250 different genes that have been described as being associated with inherited retinal disease, but the most frequently associated gene is ABCA4, which is the gene in star guards. Um, this is just a, um, a graph here, and again, doesn't matter if you can't see the numbers, I'll, I'll describe it. This is um, looking at 
um, uh, certificate of visual vision impairment registrations every year since 2009 up until before the pandemic and um, uh, showing that the biggest cause uh, is uh, genetic eye disease, hereditary eye disease, most of that is inherited retinal disease, um, and that dwarfs m most of the other causes. Diabetic eye disease was a big cause. Um, it still is, but it's gone, thankfully, down a bit over the years with better treatments, better screening, um, but inherited retinal disease is still up there as, as the biggest cause in the working age. Um, and then this is just a graph showing in our big cohort of, of uh, inherited retinal disease patients at Moorfields, the different um, numbers of families or numbers of patients with disease relating to a particular gene, and you don't need to read the genes, but the um, the main thing to notice is there's a big bar on the left where, where um, over 20% of the patients are, and they have disease related to ABCA4, the gene that's associated with Stargardt disease. Um, what does it look like um, when we, uh, so, so patients experience usually loss of central vision first, and then to a variable degree, they may lose peripheral vision or, or, or may not. Um, and when we look into the eye, we look at the retina, there's some pictures at the top of, of the kind of view we get when we look through our lenses on the slit lamp. Um, and we can see the, the retinas there and the, the nerve and the blood vessels. And there's an area where the cells that detect light, the photoreceptors have been lost in the center. Um, and then there are these yellow flecks that you may or may not be able to see, but we often see in the retina of patients with Stargardt's. And then we have this other uh, imaging modality uh, way of sort of taking pictures of the eye. It's called autofluorescence, where um, we shine in light of one wavelength and, and the retina reflects light back of a longer wavelength. And that often uh, is much more useful to us than, than the old fashioned, just looking in or taking a normal um, photo of the retina in, in diagnosing Stargardt disease and, and many other diseases. Often the abnormalities are, are much more um, clear on autofluorescence imaging. So we get that on uh, from... Um, many of our patients. Uh, and then this is just to show that's quite variable. So these are all autofluorescence images, but sometimes it's a little bit of the retina, unfortunately, almost always in the center, which is the most important bit of the retina, that's um, abnormal in Stargardt's here, this sort of black bit in the center is the abnormal bit and everything else is normal. Um, or it can be, it can affect quite a lot of the retina and it can be even more severe and very severe in this patient. And it seems to depend on what the particular changes are in the gene. So one thing we're trying to look at uh, is why um, you know disease associated with the same gene can be so variable. And it seems to be related to what changes you have in, in the gene for Stargardt and ABCA4. And, and um, that kind of sounds like that should be straightforward, but actually it's very complicated. So we've got the same variant doing very different things in different people. And we've got a previous grant from the Macular Society trying to investigate just that, trying to work out why, why different um, genetic changes work in different ways. Another thing that helps us assess patients, and this is all kind of relevant because we're going to try and correlate all of these measurements that we make in our patients okay. to to um, uh, the symptoms of photopsy and photophobia that we're going to talk about later. Um, the other thing, way of uh, assessing our patients is with something called the electroretinogram. So many um, of you might have had this test done where electrodes are put around the eye and bright flashes are, are, are shone into the eye and you're in the dark for a while and then you're in the light for a while and often people find it very uncomfortable. Um, but that tells us a lot about how the cells in the retina are responding to light. So they can look normal or abnormal on images, but they don't. that doesn't always tell us are they working well or not? They could look normal, but not be working well. And there's, we've known for quite a while that the, the results we get on the electroretinogram can sometimes predict how a patient might do in the future. Are they going to likely to lose their peripheral vision or not? Uh, and the way we record the electroretinogram is with uh, an electrode in the eye which normally is okay with that, even without any anesthetic drops and an electrode um, outside the eye. And we're basically measuring the, the voltage across the eye in response to different flashes of light. This is a, a picture I use in all my slides that was taken of me 20 years ago. And um, when I looked up, very different from now. 
and had more hair. And um, I always remember in 2019, I was in Vancouver at a conference and my PhD student came to me and said, oh, someone's got your picture on their slide, on their poster. So I went there and I said, oh, you know, that's me. And the guy sort of looked at it and looked at me and he goes, no, I don't, don't think so. That's what 20 years of aging did. Um, I said, no, no, it is me. So no, no, I got it off the internet. I said, yeah, I put it on the internet. That's where you got it from. Uh, anyway, that that's recording the electroretinogram. Uh, it's another way of recording with gold foil electrodes that aren't so comfortable. Um, and, and we get these squiggles, uh, these waveforms that, again, I'm not going to go through here, but they tell us a bit about what uh, what's happening in the retina and which cells are working and which cells aren't working. And, um, uh, and I spend a lot of my time mathematically trying to model these waveforms to, to work out, uh, you know, to, to try and improve on what they can tell us uh, about the retina. Uh, and when I, I often say when I tell people I, I work in modeling, they look at me a bit funny and wonder what kind of modeling I do. I said, no, mathematical modeling of electrophysics. Oh, yeah, you look like the kind of guy who'd probably do that. Um, so uh, and uh, we've we've applied, um, you know, artificial intelligence being applied to everything. Now we've even applied it to these electroretinogram recordings uh, to see if we can um, uh, use machine learning to classify patients into different categories and also again i'm not going to go through this uh, slide but one thing that i mentioned at the start that bewilders us about stargardt's is there are thousands of different changes in the gene that could give rise to it and now we're getting a handle using electrophysiology of of what you know how severe each change in the gene is so some are associated with mild disease and some are associated with severe disease uh, and that's kind of shown here but i'm not going to go through it it's just uh, it's just one nice thing that came out of this study was that we could use the the electrophysiology to to score each change in the gene and then if you know the patient's change in changes in in their gene you might be able to predict how severe their disease might be and you might also know which patient should be treated first if we ever get a therapy um, another thing uh, that we're looking at many people find um, conventional electrophysiology quite uncomfortable often have to wait many months to have it done. Um, you have to have dilating drops that blur the vision even more for a few hours. Uh, and, uh, and and often it's a visit to some remote uh, far off hospital. It might not be their regular hospital. We do. Uh, there are these commercial devices available. I don't have any commercial interest in them, but I, I think they're really good um, that are handheld. So what's shown here is that the same electroretinogram being recorded from someone, but with this handheld device that we can even just use in our clinic. So the patient doesn't have to go to another department. Many months later, they could have the recordings within the clinic. They don't even need the pupil to be dilated with dilating drops because this thing can measure how big the pupil is and then deliver um uh you know the right the right flash intensity to to give the right illumination to the retina um and i think this could revolutionize things because within a few minutes we could get the information we need rather than with an hour's testing many months down the line at least to to, to grade the severity of disease and we've got a big um grant application we're just putting in now um uh, to to look at whether these devices can really help in in stargardt's and a range of other disease uh, and we'd welcome your input or any comments you have on that uh, and if we do get it we'll be setting up an advisory group and and you'd be welcome to to, to join that um so do get in touch so in terms of treatments obviously everyone wants to know about that that's the main uh, uh stumbling block we do advise our patients to avoid excess vitamin a that's not really a treatment it's just a bit of advice because in animal models it seems if you have too much vitamin a like no, vitamin a is good for you it allows you to see but in star guards there seems to be a block in the cycling of vitamin a in the retina so if you have too much not in the diet but really those you know supplements that have hundreds of times of the amount of vitamin a you could normally have um, then it could make the disease worse. So we do say avoid any supplements with excess vitamin A in. Um, if excess vitamin A makes things worse, maybe things that deplete vitamin A in the retina could help. Uh, and, and that's certainly being trialed at the moment, certain different types of things, uh, different types of medication that might reduce the amount of vitamin A in the retina or a different vitamin A that the retina can't use. Um, and, and there is some evidence that might slow degeneration so that that's still being investigated at the moment. Gene therapy, as I mentioned, um, uh, that we've got that for a particular a different disease, not Stargardt's, but we are able to inject the right copy of the gene into the retina, and it seems to help in that condition. Um, people have been trying for Stargardt's, um, but the gene's very big, and although there have been some trials in France and the US that haven't really reported yet, and it doesn't seem that they've been, um, you know, 
to date very good results in fact my colleague Matteo uh, my very clever colleague Matteo who you're going to hear from soon uh, is is on another project working on ways of trying to deliver this big gene into the retina which which is more challenging than the small gene that's that's being treated at the moment um stem cell therapies everyone asks about there's advances being made but no one's really been able to replace the cells that detect like the photoreceptors in in humans yet electronic implants into the retina maybe can help in very very severe disease but they can have complications and and don't give a very good level of vision and optogenetics is another um uh, area of research where you know if the cells that detect light have died away the cells that connect the retina to the brain are still there can we make them light sensitive by making them express a gene that makes them sense light and there are some interesting results but no uh, far from being a treatment yet that's approved because uh, we're, we're, it's still being investigated uh, so current research is uh, looking at therapies, improving our ability to diagnosis, uh, di diagnose Stargardts, to understand the, the different genetic changes that can give rise to Stargardts and why they behave so differently, and understanding symptoms, which is really what, what we're going to talk, talk about tonight, or Matteo is going to talk about the symptoms of photopsia and photophobia. So photopsia, um, these are medical terms, but photopsia is flashing light, seeing flashes of light when they're not really, there's not really anything flashing in the environment. It's within your eye or your brain is perceiving flashes of light. And photophobia is a term meaning a kind of aversion to light. So bright lights or even kind of normal intensity lights can make some people feel some pain in their eye or it doesn't always cause cause pain but it just the the vision isn't very good there's some kind of discomfort and people prefer the lights to be dim um so this is something we see in in a number of inherited retinal diseases um we see it in in uh, sometimes in retinitis pigmentosa we see it in diseases that affect the cone photoreceptors um uh the the cells that give us good vision in bright light sometimes those conditions give you photophobia and we also see it in star guards and i have to say that i had thought about it in the other conditions but didn't think it was very common in star guards until mateo came and told me about it and uh, and then i started talking to my patients and asking them about it and they said yes actually it is quite debilitating but i don't know why many patients don't always volunteer it maybe they've seen lots of doctors before me who've dismissed it and therefore they don't talk about it or they've just learned to you know there's nothing you can do anyway so i won't mention it but um i i started asking patients specifically about it and i realized it's you know more common than, than i thought before so it does seem to impact in some patients, at least quite a lot on their quality of life. Obviously, Stargardt's, um, you know, having poor central vision has a big impact on your quality of life, and especially if the peripheral vision goes as well. But sometimes it's these symptoms that aren't necessarily just about visual loss, but are about flashing lights and aversion to bright lights that that can have a big impact on people's quality of life. Seems to affect some people more than others. We haven't seen a pattern yet, especially like particular genetic changes cause it and others don't. We haven't really seen that yet but it's something we want to look at um it's difficult to measure we those scans i, sh I showed you and the electroretinogram you know we can measure uh, amplitudes and widths of cell layers and things like that and 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 quantify things quantify degeneration but things like photopsia flashing lights and photophobia aren't so easy to measure and when something's not easy to measure it's very easy for doctors to just ignore it because you just kind of put well i can't measure it so just put it in a box maybe that's what's happening or maybe patients are, are frustrated so they don't often don't mention it because you know when they mentioned it a long time ago it didn't seem to to get anywhere i'm, I'm not sure but um that may be you know the first way of i think dealing with something or understanding something is trying to measure it so that you can you know give it some sort of severity and then work out what might help it and what might make it worse quite difficult to manage uh, these symptoms it's not like we can give a tablet and they go away um there are other kinds of um uh, analogous neurological um things that happen in the brain that some tablets can help with but these things that are happening in the retina aren't so easy to treat with tablets um and and it's actually worth looking at uh we think because it could give us insight into disease mechanisms and if we know more about the disease we might have other ways of of, of developing new therapies so understanding why some people get it and some don't is it is it a precursor to getting some degeneration in the particular area where you're seeing the flashing lights or not it or does it not have anything to do with that all of this i think exploring it more could help us understand the the disease 
more as well as help our patients manage these symptoms and maybe developing treatments for the symptoms, but we could also maybe help us uh, develop uh, better treatments uh, or, or more promising treatments for the disease. So the conclusion of that is more research is definitely needed. And I'm going to go on to Matteo, who, who's very much leading the research. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions now, or I don't know whether we should go on to uh, Matteo's talk first, or what do you think, Colin? I think I think if we go straight on to uh, Matteo, and then we can take questions, um, then we can just open up the, the floor um, via the chat um, to both of you at the end of that, if that's all right. Sure, so I'll stop sharing. Brilliant, thank you, Omar. So Matteo, over to you. Yes, so let me share my slides. Okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Matteo Rizzi, and I started the lab at the Institute of Ophthalmology at UCL, and also we do some of the work at Morefields Eye Hospital, where we collaborate a lot with uh, Professor Omar Maru and other clinicians. And I put, I only have a few slides just as um, to help the conversation, but uh, there is no need to follow them particularly. And the first photo that I'm showing is a photo of the connection between the two buildings. On the right, you have Morphid's Eye Hospital, and on the left, you have the labs where we do our research. And my group, as well as other groups, and Omar's group as well, we work across these two buildings very much. So we do some of the work in the brick building, which is the lab where we do our research. And in particular, my lab focuses on trying to develop gene therapy. So we have another project that I'm not going to mention tonight, but um, Omar mentioned briefly, where we're trying to develop a gene therapy approach for Stargard disease. Perhaps another time we will talk about that. And then also we do some work that I think is very important for us in the hospital with the patients. And I think that work is important because I discovered over the years that starting a project by asking patients what they can see, what they struggle to see, you know, what it feels like to have a certain condition uh, cannot be beaten is the best way for us scientists to start the um, any project that we do. So now actually I kind of made it a rule in my lab that people should first speak to the patients, understand how they see um, the world. And based on that, then we can go and develop complicated gene therapy approaches. So I'm going to show you another photo, which is really at the core of this project that we are discussing tonight. This is a photo of the lab. Not everyone was there on that day, but this was the day when Hasina presented the poster of the work that we're going to talk about. So Hasina is really the person behind this project, um, both as a scientist, but also because of her personal experience, because Hasina was diagnosed with Stargard disease several years ago. And so she has this unique point of view where she can, you know, first of all, report what it's like um, to what, how her vision is affected, but also at the same time, apply her scientific mind to try and solve uh, this problem. So this was a, a day when there was a symposium and Hasina presented the work. Uh, and I will show you only a couple of slides from, from this work. So as Omar said, the, the project, which is actually now funded by a PhD studentship by the Macular Society, which Hasina will start in a few months, um, it's a project that is focused on two symptoms of Stargard disease, symptoms that we now know are uh, of Stargard disease and were known previously for other conditions. So one of them is what you could call light flashes, um, or if you want to use a more medical term, photopsia. That essentially means that uh, when you have a certain degeneration in the uh, part, part of your eye, part of your retina, um, people have been reporting flashes. Um, I'm showing here one type of flash, which is a bit like a firework, if you want, like a, a bit of a um, you know the classic camera flash. And another type below instead, that is more like flickering lights, throughout the field of view. And we found, first of all, we found that this is quite common, as you, you will see in the next slide, it's quite common in patients with uh, forms of macular degeneration, in this case, particularly Stargard disease. And we also found that there are there is a lot of variability in what these flashes look like. So for some patients, it looks more like the picture above, so like a single camera flash. For other patients, instead, it looks more like the bottom, like flickering lights. 
Um, other people, including Hasina, report him more as kind of like spiral that uh, even moves around her central vision. And so this tells us that there is a whole, you know, um, range of uh, ways in which these flashes can appear. But, you know, I keep going back to Hasina because this is really um, her brainchild. And, uh, you know, talking about it, I, I now understand that there is a very personal aspect to these flashes because they appear out of nowhere. They are sudden and they're unexpected. And so um, my understanding now is that they can be quite um, surprising, sometimes even scary that this happens to, to your vision. So one thing that we're doing and that would be very much the focus of Hasina's PhD is to try and correlate these with the type of uh, degeneration that has unfortunately been happening in the eyes. So one idea, for example, is to try and understand how many years the person has lived with a certain condition, has you know uh, felt and has been told by the doctors to have a certain condition, does that make it more or less likely that you will have these kind of flashes or does the shape or color or position of these flashes change depending um, how many years you know, have passed since you were diagnosed. The, the second um, symptom that Omar mentioned is this extreme light sensitivity. So sometimes we call it uh, photophobia, although that to me personally makes me think of, I don't know, arachnophobia or other types of phobias. And that's not necessarily what we mean. What we mean, as, as Omar said, is that sometimes this causes pain, um, aversion. You know, you feel like you'd rather not be exposed to light essentially. So uh, I'm going to show a couple of pictures which represent the same scene of children playing in a field. Uh, but in the top picture is just downloaded from the internet as it is. And we try and mimic with the help of some patients what uh, they feel like this extreme light sensitivity looks like. And so essentially it's as if everything is very saturated. It's as if everything is very bright and very white. And you, first of all, you lose the ability to see details in the scene, of course, but also it, none of us likes being flooded with uh, with light and having a uh, overwhelmingly white picture in front of us. Uh, and this that that's why the name phobia, right? The name, uh, the word aversion, for example, comes in. So, with the uh, discussing with Hasina, we sort of have a very interesting convergence, which I think is is you know the the best moments in in scientific research is when. The hypothesis we have in uh, among scientists in the lab match actually the experience that patients report. And so we thought we just thought hypothetically this might be the case, but Hasina was able to tell us that this was truly the case and that these two symptoms, the light flashes and the light aversion, were um, something she experienced. So we decided to, you know, wearing the scientific hat, we decided to investigate this further. And so Hasina designed a questionnaire, which uh, at the time was deployed both through um, Omar and uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital uh, to patients registered there, but also in an um, anonymous form through Stargard Connected, another charity. And we will now expand this questionnaire, but at the, at the time we had this kind of pilot study to try and understand how prevalent this was. You know, maybe uh, you know, it was, this was not going to be a prevalent issue. But it turns out actually that is very prevalent. So they're both very prevalent. So in terms of the light flashes or photopsia, as we called it, we found that nearly 90% of the uh, people that we surveyed with Stargard disease had experienced uh, this. And in the case of the excessive light sensitivity or photophobia or photoversion, however you want to call it, still the majority, about 60% of them reported having these, uh, these kind of problems. So first of all, this told us that um, this was a very prevalent uh, thing, two very prevalent uh, phenomena, two very prevalent symptoms within patients with Stargard disease. And um, also it was very interesting to dwell a bit more on what the um, feeling was of these flashes. I told you briefly that the shape of the flashes change. Hasina found also that the color of these flashes change and we have started now looking more in detail at uh, trying to correlate uh, these things, trying to understand better the mechanisms behind it. In terms of the uh, light sensitivity, 
also we're trying to uh, understand that and particularly we're trying to understand how much this impairs vision because of course you could you know uh, some people wear sunglasses to try and reduce this a bit but um, in the end this makes vision worse and we're trying to think of ways where maybe we could actually help and and make it make it normal or make it better than than it is um, the last thing I want to show you from the survey is that uh, we decided with Hasina to leave the, the at the end of the survey, we allowed people to just have like a box where they could spontaneously write what they wanted, if they wanted. And uh, uh, there were some very interesting comments, which were, to be honest, quite motivating for us in continuing and doing more of this research. Um, I'm going to read uh, the comments for you. So one patient said, I'm delighted to hear that this may be looked into as it is one of the biggest impacts on my vision. And when I mentioned it at appointments, they seem to say it's not related to my stargars, but I feel it is. And another patient expressed a similar feeling by say, <laughs> bluntly stating, I've asked why this happens and no one knows. So we don't know yet. Uh, none of us knows yet exactly. Uh, this. That's the point of, of research, right? We try and do it to understand things that we don't know. But I'm quite confident that um, Hasina has a very good chance over her PhD to try and answer these uh, these questions. I put my email address just to conclude in uh, this slide again, because we're always very happy to, to engage with people, to speak with them, and like I said, to understand how it feels like um, to have a certain eye condition, um, but also because we're very happy if someone wants to contribute to this research Hasina is doing, uh, to the questionnaire, perhaps even we can explore options to you know include uh, further tests. Uh, we'd be very happy to hear from you. So if you uh, want to email either Omar or myself, uh, we'd definitely be happy to to discuss and uh, maybe show you around around the lab. And this is it. This was my last slide. So I guess if Colin agrees, probably we can move on to the we, question time. Absolutely, we can. Brilliant. It's uh, say fantastic. I mean, that was very interesting from both of you too. Thanks very much. Um, I just, just to, I don't want to, you know, still, I mean, I, as you may or may not know, I've lived with Stargardt's um, for, uh, since I was eight and I'm 51 now, and I've experienced life, light flashes, um, swirling lights primary of primary colours, which I can't see, which is really bizarre, bizarre and highly light avert aversion, uh, very sensitive to light where it, it can be debilitating so um i know there's lots and lots of questions in the in the um in the in the chat so i'll, I'll hand over to um to geraldine to go through some of those but, but I, I mean as i said this is very close to my heart because this is the bit of my my central vision has gone um and and this is the bit that affects me the most these days actually because i can get around mm -hmm. everything else this is the bit that gives me the most difficulty. So mm -hmm. uh, I shall hand over to Geraldine to ask you some of those great questions that were coming through. Brilliant. Lovely, thank you. Yes, we've got quite a few. Um, then I'm gonna start with the ones on Stargardt's and then because lots of people have put in other questions that um, have other, other eye conditions and how it's affected them. So the first one, is Stargardt disease a dominant or recessive disease? And I think that's a really interesting question because you talk about ABCA4 being the gene, but you can sometimes be due to other genes yeah so so it's a it's a bit confusing uh because um uh, obviously these genes uh, these diseases were described often named after people uh, before the genes were described and then people use it in different ways and we try now to move to um describing diseases by the gene because then you know we don't need to worry about what the guy was called and what he really looked at uh, all those years ago um so uh so, so you are right that people do talk about other forms of stargarts that are non abca4 but um what the, the most common gene that causes stargarts and and these days we just kind of refer to to it with the gene is abca4 and that's recessive so you we have two copies of most of our genes one from mum one from dad and in recessive diseases you need to have a problem with both copies of the gene so with uh, uh, abca4 associated disease the commonest cause of stargardt's um it's recessive and um you have to have a problem with both copies and if you had a problem with just one copy, you wouldn't get the disease. Um, uh, there are other conditions, the so-called dominant stargarts. There are some other genes, uh, PRPH2, ELOV, there's a whole list of them uh, that, that can cause uh, something that looks like stargarts, um, but is dominantly inherited. You only have to have a problem with one copy of that 
other gene, not ABCA4, one of those other genes, uh, and you can get something that's a bit like Stargardt's. Um, and um, these days, we tend not to call that Stargardt's, although some people do, and they call it dominant Stargardt's, but we try and go with the genes now. Thank you. It's, it's an evolving situation. Yeah. yeah, I can see that. Thank you. Um, so can you say a little bit about how the disease can affect um, children um, and the different rates of progression and when it can ages it can affect people? Yeah. So the, the answer and often the answer that we give is it's very variable, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, good if it's milder, but um, it, it's it's never uh, no two patients have exactly the same experience. And it seems to be related to what the particular changes are in in the gene. So some changes in, in the ABCA4 gene spelling mistakes in the gene really kind of mess up the the function of what it's meant to do and often those um, uh, patients are affected in childhood their central vision uh, goes down in childhood and it may progress and sometimes the peripheral vision might go as well but not always there are other people who are affected with um, probably usually different changes in the same gene um, who uh, could not get symptoms until adulthood and sometimes uh, it's just the central vision that goes but the peripheral vision stays very good generally the later it presents the better in terms of it tends to be milder disease and we have seen even people in their 50s with quite good vision and amazingly they have got changes in that gene um, and we've seen people present in childhood and and it gets progressively worse so unfortunately there's not not one answer that i can give you it can vary but there are um in many people it stabilizes in later life but but there are people who just continue to progress Yes, I thought that when I looked at one of your scans, I thought that must be affecting peripheral vision, not just central vision. Yeah, absolutely. And that happens in <clears throat> some Thank you. Um, next one is, um, is Stargardt monocular or binocular or either? Uh, so does it affect, um, it, so, so it affects both eyes uh, as most genetic conditions because the genes in each eye are, are the same. Most of them affect both eyes. We have got a few patients who are affected more mildly in one eye than the other. So there must be some either random or something else going on that makes the disease worse in one eye than the other. Um, but most patients have both eyes affected and quite similarly. Yeah. Um, so there's people reporting about what, what they're experiencing. Um, and somebody talks about um, experiencing traces of light, um, particularly red light. So car brake lights, red traffic lights. Is that a particular type of um, photopsia? Maybe? Yeah, so um, it, it, again, it's very variable and I've heard patients describe things in different ways. Sometimes it's blue lights and not red lights. So mm -hmm. it's something that that is part of what we're studying. And I don't know if Matteo, yeah. you've got any thoughts as to why people might see one light or another? Uh, so we don't know yet, like Omar said. We definitely see people clustering towards, grouping towards certain colors in some cases. So some people are very convinced that what they see is, I don't know, white and purple. And other people instead find that this uh, varies a lot. Um, I see that in that question, the person was saying, I've always been told I'm imagining it, so I stopped telling anyone, which is, that also is quite unfortunately common from, from what we hear. I guess it's difficult when when something is in your perception in how you see things it's sometimes difficult i guess for people to um to believe you unfortunately sometimes uh, and that's also why it's a little difficult for us we're trying to find ways to study this but it's always difficult to um look inside the mind of people and know exactly what what they're seeing and and why okay so that same person experiencing the red light seems like she might get migra migraines as well. Is there any connection at all? The aura with migraines? Maybe so, aware. I mean, what we can say is that the light sensitivity the, in its most extreme form, and if repeated and if prolonged, seems to lead to migraines. Um, again, this is something that I first learned from Hasina, who, who told me the same kind of experience where, you know, if we're talking about a few minutes, you call it as a light sensitivity. But if you're exposed to it for the whole day, eventually it leads to to migraine and what we think again this is something we are studying but what we think is that there are different channels different connections from the eye to the brain and they go to different parts of the brain and probably this uh, excessive stimulation this excessive sensitivity to light means that it kind of overactivating pathways uh, you know channels that that cause migraine so the reason why people that experience this light sensitivity are also likely to have migraines, 
might be this kind of overactivation by light of our um, visual system. I can I can really I can uh, you know agree with that completely because I mean I have days where I mean I I called it glared out for years, but it, it's just where um, especially in the spring and the autumn when the sun's a bit lower, um, I, my eyes will effectively shut down for most of the day because they're just mm -hmm. being over overstimulated with light. So and no no set of sunglasses or filters or anything stops it. It just mm -hmm. it, it kind of glares me out. My vision just stops stops. Um, you know, which is as I say, which is one of the reasons so debilitating. And I've met other people with um, with Stargarts who who talk who who can't under quite understand how I because mine gets completely glared out, whereas they were slightly light sensitive but not the same. So as you say, it's just it's a, horses for courses. It's so different for everybody. It must be mm. hard to, hard to assess. Yeah, and 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 migraine. I mean, uh, we don't even we know what causes migraine, so so it's hard to answer. There's definitely an overlap in the symptoms. We think, at least how neurologists think about migraine, is that it's uh, something different. It's in the brain that is what's happening rather than in in the retina. But definitely, as Matteo says, it's quite possible that um, if someone might have some susceptibility to migraines, this could set it off as many things could trigger migraines, or or maybe there's more of an overlap. And some people think there is a retinal component in migraine. Um, something to do with the eye rather than just it being in the brain, but uh, but we don't know really. So uh, I'm sorry if I missed this in your talk, but is it actually it's in the retina that's causing the flashes, not something in the brain? I mean, I guess we don't know that either yet. Uh, because the degeneration happens in the retina, it's very likely that that's where the source of mm. the problem is. Of course, you could argue, and that seems the, the, you know, the most uh, likely explanation. Of course, you could argue that uh, there could be a series of consequences to the degeneration, some of which might be consequences in the brain. But, you know, if I had to, if I had to guess, I would say, yes, it's because of the degeneration in the, in the retina. Thanks. Um, there's quite a few people asking about sunglasses um, and sort of looking for advice to how to cope with the glare. Got anything? So what, uh, what, yeah, I mean, one thing I, I, I read, uh, I think it's flashed away now, but uh, somewhere in the chat, people wondering about um, sunglasses making the eyesight worse. It, it yeah. um, sunglasses don't harm the eyesight, um, but but I think I think anyway, Matteo, you can clarify yourself. What you said. I think what you meant was that when they put the sunglasses on, they they can't see so well, so it doesn't really take away the problem. But uh, we're not saying sunglasses harm the eyes, so don't worry about wearing sunglasses. Okay. So is it a question of trying different things? I don't know what your experience is, Colin. I just I, choose the darkest but, sunglasses you can find. Or? Well, I think it, it's again, it's about finding the the glasses that suit you the best because the different filters um, will affect your eyes in different ways. So it, some people might like a yellow filter. Um, I like a quite a dark green filter, um, which always looks black. So Ray Bans and Oak, Oakleys don't have a bit of a green haze to them. Um, so it is just occasionally just walking through um, some filters. And I always, when I suggest to people to buy sunglasses, just buy the ones that block out as much UV as possible because the, the, the more the, the more glare you can reduce, I, I found this myself, the more glare that you can cut out, the more that you can see when it, even when it's particularly bright. But sometimes it just it's just overwhelming. It doesn't matter which filters you're wearing, it will just be overwhelming anyway. Um, so... Um, yeah, just trial and error is my. Don't buy fashion glasses either, and always buy ones that wrap around your face. Um, yes, wrap around. Yeah, right. So that you're, you're you're covering the whole eye because um, light travels in a straight line and can sneak in. Um, I think there's at least one person to asking about augmented reality glasses for Stargarts. Um, I'm wondering if they're thinking about what what I call smart glasses, um, mm. oxide that mm. type of. Glass, yeah, I think that looks very promising. Um, uh, it, I think as, as um, I think your Colin said before, it's a, it's a trial and error thing. And if people find it helps, then then definitely. And there are lots of um, very uh, you know from from the very kind of basic um, optical aids to to very sophisticated ones that are available. And some people seem to get on with them, and some don't. Um, it, 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 there's no harm in in terms of uh, as in it's not going to harm the eyes to to use any of these uh, or most of these. Um, uh, uh kind of visual aids and and and, and so i think if it fi you find it works then then that's great but but i, I suspect not everyone will, will have the same experience 
Okay, interesting one that's just come in. To what extent could the damage in the retina lead to some brain areas being either disinhibited or inhibited that could explain the light flashes and traces? Yeah, so I guess that, that's uh, that's a very good way of putting what I was saying earlier. It could be that the degeneration in the eye does something to the downstream, as we say, in, in the brain. And uh, therefore, this, this inhibition, for example, could could cause the flashes. Um, yeah, this is something, you know, for which electrophysiology, like the approach that Omar showed earlier, is very useful because if we can look in the eye and find traces, you know, find some electrophysiological activity in the eye that might explain the light flashes, that would be evidence that the problem started there. Whereas if there is no evidence from the eye, I guess we have to assume that it's something happening further down the line in the, in the visual system in the brain. Yeah, brilliant. Not, yeah, no, so I was going to say, but there is no doubt that the problem is associated with the degeneration. So obviously the, the issue to study and the thing to try and prevent or slow down is the degeneration because clearly that's the kickstarts everything. Thanks. Right, there's lots of questions. I'm just scanning through. No, no, yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Yeah. Make sure I've got everybody in trying to... No, yeah, I've yeah. heard loads coming through, yeah. I know. So somebody's got um, PXE, pseudoxanthoma elasticum, um, and they feel like everything is overexposed. So do you see this issue just not not just with Stargardt, but with lots of other eye conditions? Yeah, yeah. I think we do we get do see um, uh, strange symptoms and and uh, flashes or or like overexposure. People have maybe not used those words, but things look brighter than they should be, and with, with a number of other retinal conditions. Um, and uh, and and again, just like with Stargardt, we're not really clear as to to what would be causing that with with pseudoxanthoma elasticum one of the layers underneath the retina is quite thickened and that reduces probably the transfer of vitamin a to the retina and that can make people uh, have poorer vision in the dark in some people uh, there are other things that go on as well and again we don't understand all of the visual symptoms generally we say to anyone if they've seen i mean don't know about overexposure but any change in the vision of either eye it's worth being seen it's hard to comment without looking at the retina because sometimes in pseudoxanthoma new blood vessels can grow uh, underneath the retina that that can cause vision loss and 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 can need treatment um but um but normally that causes a, a loss of vision or a blurring of vision or a distortion rather than a feeling of overexposure so yeah not sure mm. okay i mean there's a few people who've who've sounds like they've got age-related macular degeneration and they're experiencing some problems and we know people experience problems with glare with, with that condition as well um, one person sounds like she's using um, sort of lubricant eye drops, which contain vitamin A. Would that be an issue? Yeah, it, um, if you, it, I think when I saw it, it was someone with macular degeneration, not star. Mm. So yeah. yeah, I think that that's fine. The the vitamin A uh, thing, and then again, it may not be that much in 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 some of those topical preparations. But um, the 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 advice about avoiding things with loads of vitamin A and is is specific to star guards because we think that and 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 of star with the ABC. 4 gene because that's where the block seems to be uh, in the vision the visual cycle whereas um, we don't think necessarily it would be harmful in, in macular degeneration although there are lots of other similarities between stargots and macular degeneration um, age related but th this wouldn't be one of them so you should mm. be fine to, to use that yeah I mean there's treatments in clinical trials which are aimed at both stargot and dry AMD aren't there um, so there's similarities although i've heard some people say that that's not really true i don't know <laughs> uh, it depends uh, i mean uh, it's uh, depends how you define it there are definitely similarities the same bits of the retina degenerate there are there are lots of similarities but there are lots of big differences as well so i guess it depends which way you want to look at it it used to be <laughs> thought that abca4 could be a genetic cause of age-related macular degeneration as well and there was a big study that seemed to show that and then that was kind of overturned later and we don't think the gene ABC4 is really involved even in contributing to normal age-related macular degeneration. There are some other genes that might contribute, but not probably ABC4. I'm struggling. There's somebody asked about um, some research by Alteus Pharmaceutical. Um, and I know I've heard of that, but I can't remember which treatment they might be trialing for Stargardt off the top of my head. Uh, not sure. I can't no. remember. There's a lot of trials going on and it's difficult yeah. to keep track of them all. I try, but... <laughs> There's too many. There's too many. 
No, really, I mean, it's, it's great. I'm not complaining. No, 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 it's good. <laughs> I just, just, my brain isn't big enough, yeah. Um, I don't know how you feel, but it's all right. <laughs> so another one that's just come in, I always have a retinal scan when I have an eye test. So how different is an eye health scan? Um, my high history optician suggested my eye, the eye health scan when I mentioned the photophobia symptoms. They said eye drops would be used to dilate the pupils. So what sort of scan do you think? That's being yeah, so um, people have funny names for things. I'm not really sure what an eye health scan is. I guess any scan you have, we're looking at the, the health of the eye. So I'm not sure. Uh, as you say, having a retinal scan, I think, is is, is a good idea if um, I, I don't know if it depends whether you have stargots or or age related macular degeneration i don't think everyone necessarily needs an oct scan if they haven't got any problems with their vision but if they do then then i think it it it, it can be helpful um but i don't know what the eye health scan is whether it's just a combination of tests they do in that opticians and um um i, I suppose if you have some symptoms uh, then then getting in investigated is a good idea um it, if if you didn't have anything and your vision was fine then i don't think you necessarily need to have more than the usual pressure check and the glasses check yeah I've, i heard it quoted the other day that 93 percent of opticians have oct scans now um oh. so but you generally have to pay extra extra for them they're not part of the <laughs> nhs eye test unfortunately yeah Oh, this this person said, I don't have macular degeneration, but my 97 year old mother has. I had a retinal scan two months ago. Yeah. So, yeah. so again, I think if you, if you don't have any problems, um, uh, then uh, uh, then then not necessarily that you, you don't necessarily need one. Um, but uh, uh, macular degeneration, there is a, a, sm a genetic component. So if your mother has, then you are a bit more likely than the average person Um but that's just you know a bit more likely. It doesn't mean you'll definitely get it. Mm. I'm going to have to guess that they were referring to an OCT scan. Yes, yeah, I might be wrong. <laughs> Ask them what they call it. Yes, what what is the eye health scan and what you what are you getting? Yeah, might make my health a little bit more understandable. Um, right. I think I've covered everything. How are we Perfect. Doing for time? Oh, brilliant! I, I, I was going to—I was—I was, I was going to say we were getting close to the end, so uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, I, I just—I um, mean, I'm—I'm I'm very interested personally, actually, maybe to take part in this, which is very a thing I've never heard myself say, which is quite weird. So, um, because the, the, to understand a little bit more about these these light floaters and light sensitivity, I think is is a really good a really good thing to do uh somebody who's lived with star guards as long as i have um and, and sadly mine has crept out of my central vision it's moving across the eye slowly <laughs> um so um you know it is what it is but it... oh got it i heard that what about genetics and myopic <laughs> macular degeneration Sorry, I missed that one. It, I think it was came in almost as soon as the, the webinar yeah, started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, with um, uh, one thing I probably should say as well that the the common, uh, not the commonest cause, but a cause of new onset light flashes can be a uh, the jelly in the eye pulling on the retina, which can cause a tear. So, I, I should probably say just generally for anyone listening, if you mm -hmm. have new flashes that just come that you haven't had before then it is worth getting seen um because we're what we're talking about here is the flashes relating to star guards or, or retinal degenerations rather than the ones that could relate to a, a tear in the retina um but anyway i just wanted to say that um so uh genetics and myopic degeneration um very interesting so um the genetics we've been talking about are where it's a, a single gene causing a genetic disease but we know that many diseases that aren't really like that where it's a single gene probably have a genetic component so definitely myopia um uh, has uh, short sightedness has a big genetic component if your parents are short sighted you're more likely to be short sighted um but it's lots of different genes uh, with each of which kind of have a small effect that seem to then make you more susceptible to myopia and if you're more likely to be myopic then you are more likely to have um myopic degeneration you still probably won't get it but but there are some people especially if they're highly myopic that they can have a degeneration in the center of the retina um 
that looks a bit like age-related macular degeneration, but is a bit different. Um, and um, we don't know what the genetic, um, uh, uh, we know genetic associations of myopia and people are looking at, are there any particular genetic associations that make you more likely to get myopic degeneration? But that's still, uh, it's probably little effects of lots of different genes rather than a single gene, but it, it's a really interesting thing to look at. I, I, I'm, I'm, I know there's a few more questions that have come in. I mean, I've been, well, I'm just aware that we're sort of coming to, to the end of our time. Um, I might uh, collate those questions and uh, send them over to you if that's all right. Sure. Um, yeah, um, yeah. You can put them on the website or whatever and uh, so people can have their questions asked. Somebody's um, asked for the link to our YouTube channel. I don't know whether patients can find Oh, that. patients, can you pop that in, please? Yeah. Yep, I'll do that now. Yeah, brilliant, Thank thanks. Um, so... Um, Okay, um, guys, really thank you, Omar and, and, and Mattia. Thank you ever so much. Now, Mattia, I, I feel I'm going to have to invite you back um, to talk about your uh, gene therapy and this bigger gene oh, yeah. it's a biz, biz, business in the in the new year, because I get the feeling if I don't, I might get hunted down. So um, so it would be great if you could come back and, and, and Omar, it would be great if you came back at some point as well. Um, yeah. And just to just to go through that, so it just leaves us with time to say, um, someone has asked for the the all our all our webinars are available on the Macula Society YouTube channel, and if you subscribe, um, any time a new video goes up from either of the webinar streams, you'll get a little ping on your um, on your on or a notification telling you that it's there. Um, but uh, this is the last one of the year so it's it's great it's been a really really enthusiastic and, um, and really interesting uh, event so omar and mateo thank you ever so much for for spending the evening taking some time out of your evening with us this evening it's been great yeah no worries thank you it was great to answer so so many good questions brilliant okay pleasure Excellent. Thanks ever so much. Uh, and Geraldine, thank you for being uh, being supporting me all year as well, uh, answering all the questions. It's been really helpful. Thanks very much. I just much. looked up Alkaeus. It's, it's in a vitamin A dimer treatment. Yeah, I just Googled it as well. So the vitamin <laughs> treatment I was talking about, yeah, actually, I didn't know about that. Is, uh, it, it's like an alternative vitamin A uh, to stop, you know, as we said, too much of normal vitamin A could cause a degeneration. So there are companies looking at that and and, and the results look promising, but but we're still waiting for, for you know, more more results. More results. It's just so good. There's so much going on. It's so it's really, really cool. Um, it's, you know, when I was I remember being diagnosed and told um, that in, within my lifetime, there would be a a at least a treatment and it does look like we're heading in that direction which is great so um well fine fa fantastic so thanks guys thanks for coming along patience thanks for your help as ever um really thank you guys for uh, for, for supporting these webinars um this year um and uh, we will be back with a fresh set of webinars uh in the new year and, and just for those who who like a podcast we're now starting to convert all our webinars into podcasts so you can listen to them at your leisure wherever you like where and it's available wherever you get your podcast from so that's the way to say that as i understand it so it just leaves me to say uh thanks very much and have a good rest of the evening thanks very much and bye-bye <laughs>